and welcome. I always look forward to gathering together uh, with you folks, brothers and sisters in Christ, to experience the happiness of our congregation and uh, unity that we enjoy in our Savior. And it's always good to welcome uh, people who've been here before and to welcome them back. All of you will remember uh, Aaron and Kathy Carroll, where, well, Aaron's folks from Kansas City are with us this morning. They're over here to my right. Would you turn around and look at them and give them a big welcome? thought maybe his dad could come and uh, play the guitar for us, but I'm not sure <laughs> that's going to happen. Just come and enjoy this morning. But uh, it's good to welcome you in our Savior's name. I hope you feel the love of Christ here in uh, the people around us, as well as what occurs here. And I think that today we are going to have to say goodbye to a young family. I think the Briggs uh, are headed back towards Indiana. Is that right? Yeah, so this is their finale, their grand finale here. So make sure you say your love and your condolences to them on their departure. We're going to miss them. But pray for God's speed on their, on their journey. Pray with me as we get together. Pray with me as we launch into a time of worship and fellowship. Father, you brought us together because in eternity you chose us to be a part of the body of Christ. Before we were even a thought. You had your mind on us and saw us and chose us and predestined us to conformity to the Savior. It's a great privilege to know that and to be a part of that group. Uh, keep us, Lord, from entitlement. Keep us from selfishness and from pride. The pride of being a believer. We are believers because you worked in us without our help and without our assistance prior to our even being a thought in someone's mind. We are privileged people, and we want to celebrate that today in actuality, and not be fakes, and not to pretend. So break us out, Lord, of any sort of plastic mentality, just going through the motions. Let our time be together be authentic, and celebrative, and real, and sincere. Accept our praise, accept our love, and our weakness, and our confession, and our desire, Lord, to draw closer to our Savior. Hear us, bless us, fill us, forgive us, and celebrate our Savior, Lord, in our hearts today, we pray through Christ our Lord. Please worship. Thank you once again. That's quite the performance, isn't it? They can sing, they can dance, they can memorize, they can answer questions. Very impressive. Yes, good morning again. How many of you kids, if you raise your hand, how many of you kids really enjoy listening to the band? Raise your hand up. Let me see. Okay, none of the kids enjoy it. How about the adults? How many of the adults learn from it? I love it. Thank you. Maybe the kids didn't understand what I was saying. They were trying to raise their hand. They were trying to raise their hand. But that, we owe a debt of gratitude to you. You guys are just so good. And um, maybe uh, one of those little girls ought to be on the worship team? What do you think? Yeah. What do you think? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Better them than me, right? <laughs> what, what addition they would add. To, uh, we're grateful for it. What they do for each one of us. Well, it's time now to fellowship together in the Word. And I uh, look forward to this time. I hope that it will be a blessing and encouragement to uh, each one of you. And as uh, I think it's appropriate, let's take a moment to uh, look to God and to ask His favor, His blessing, His understanding on what it is we're about to Look at it today. Would you join me for a moment? Think about somebody right now that um, needs our special prayers this morning. Why don't you take a moment to pray for them? And uh, pray for understanding of their situation, for comfort from God, whatever the situation might be. Plenty of people here who need prayer. And I uh, encourage you to just go ahead and do that and wait for me to begin in just a minute. We've heard about you, Father, through the Benton family, through song, through word, through teaching, through Q&A, through pictures. You're a great God. There's so much to learn about you for our encouragement and for our steadfastness in times of uncertainty, in times of difficulty, times for these families. We have uh, the Briggs about ready to move, make a big move back to the Midwest. It's a long journey. 
It's not an easy thing to do. We have visitors from Kansas City. We have people who are struggling with issues, perhaps with finances. Uh, whatever the issue is, we come before you, we sit at your feet, we ask you to pour out your fatherly love and compassion and mercy upon all of us. Weld us together, bind us together to you and to one another, and make us more effective for the challenge we'll fa face tomorrow morning, whatever that might be. So answer our questions this morning. Fill our hopeless lives with hope, whether it's despair, it's encouragement, whether it's confusion and darkness, bring light. If there is no faith in our Savior, Lord, bring that faith today and bring someone, Lord, into your fellowship and your kingdom today. And then do, Lord, whatever you want. This is your time. It's not us. The church doesn't belong to us. It's yours. You purchased it. You paid for it. You guide it. And we are at your mercy. We are at your death. Do some great things in our lives today through your powerful word. Beyond what is said, beyond what we hope or even imagine, you're that kind of a God. We love you. We ask you to share your love with us today in the Word. We pray for your glory in Christ's name. Uh, you've heard it from me many times, but it perhaps bears just a bit of repeating that uh, I was born and raised on the mission field in the third world. That means I went to a boarding school. It's sort of like a military school in the sense that you, your parents live some other part of the country and then on, in September, they drop you off at a boarding school somewhere else in the country. And they drop you off, and they go back home until Christmas. They come back at Christmas and pick you up. I started that process in grade two. So I was about seven when I got dropped off, along with the rest of my brothers. And from September to the end, or beginning part, or middle, middle of December, I went to school with missionary kids my age all the way from grade 2, where the school started, all the way up to grade 12. And I lived in a dorm. I lived in a boys' dorm. First time there, I lived in a dorm that was combined, girls and guys. The girls were at one end of the hallway, and the guys were at the other end of the hallway. Then things got too big, so they bought a building for the boys, and bought buildings for the girls, and separated from each other. And, and our schools were downtown. Of course, it was not a city. It was a little, little wee town, only about 10,000 people. On the, School was in the center of the town with all of the academic buildings and playgrounds and all that. And then our dorms were out on the outskirts of the city. So we would walk to school every day. And I had to walk with the rest of the kids on the way to school as a group on the sidewalk. It felt like a little military procession. But I could go home any way I wanted at any time I wanted. And that's what I chose. I liked the adventure of walking through the fields and going different places, exploring. And eventually end up back at the dorm, hopefully in time for supper. I did that every day. I loved the adventure, seeing things, catching animals, uh, never getting into trouble, you know me. But uh, one particular day, I was walking through this field with bushes about this high on my way home from school in the afternoon, and I heard gunshots. Now, that's not an unusual thing. Back in the day, there was no need for any kind of permits. Everybody had guns, and people had fun with guns. But I heard gunshots, and it was powerful. It was a high-powered rifle. So I looked in this field, and I was all by myself, alone. Uh, I don't remember what grade exactly I was. I probably was in grade five, really old and mature. And I saw a man about 100 yards from me with a rifle, and he was just taking target practice, but not with a target with a bullseye. He was just taking pot shots at anything around that he could see. If there was a tree in the distance, he shot at the tree, tin cans. Uh, birds that were flying by, he just take shots, and then he saw me. He stopped and pointed his rifle at me. You know, I'm not a, a fearful kid. I've basically been fearless all my life. Nothing has ever scared me. A few times I've been scared. I was hanging on a cliff one day that I shouldn't have climbed, and I was about ready to fall to my death, and uh, I felt a little bit of fear at that time. But when I had a rifle, a high-powered rifle, pointed at me by a stranger who'd been shooting, and he pointed at me, I was, felt very in danger. I felt very insecure, because there was nowhere to hide. There was no trees that I could hide behind. And I knew that even though I was a fast runner, I could not outrun a bullet shot from a high-powered rifle. I felt very exposed, very in a, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous condition. And I didn't know what to do. 
And I was easy to spot. I had bright red hair against a dark background. I mean, he could pick me off. And no one would ever know. Then found me the next morning. I really wanted to hide. Was that a place to hide? There are times in our life when we should not hide. And we should not hide what we believe. We should not hide or keep to ourselves what we believe about Jesus and about God and about what the Scripture says. There are times to hide, and there's times that we shouldn't hide. And Jesus wants to address that issue. He's not allowing fear of people, our friends, and people at work, and people in hospital, and people at school, not to be afraid to speak up. Our propensity and our natural thing is to be quiet and not let people know. After all, if they know what we believe, if they hear us speaking about our faith, what will they think of us? That question nips a lot of good things in the, in the butt, doesn't it? What will they say about me? They'll laugh at me. Strange that some people are willing to face bullets, but they are unable to face laughter from people. Now, before we look at our text, and we go, might as well go ahead and look at it in Luke 12, I wanted to draw a frame, or I want to frame this passage, because probably it's something you've never seen before in your life, in your study of the Bible. But I view the Bible canonically, and when you both view the Bible canonically, everything fits together. So I want to connect some dots this morning that perhaps you've never seen connected with regard to this passage. But let me read it first. You'll see it's in two sections. Both have to do with being scared and being fearful. Chapter 12, verse 1. 1 through 3, he wants to warn us not to hide what we really believe about Jesus. And in the second paragraph, he wants to tell us that if we fear God more than anything else, it'll be a cure for our fear of people. So let's have a read at it. Meanwhile, when many thousands in the crowd had gathered so they were trampling on one another, those things are important to understand here, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. As you know, sometimes he speaks to crowds. Sometimes he speaks individually to people. This time he spoke to this vast group called his disciples. Not the twelve. They're the apostles. In Luke, the apostles, or the disciples, are men and women of all ages who have been following him. So he says to them, be on your guard. Watch out. Be vigilant against the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees. He's just talked about the Pharisees and how they use public worship ceremonies as a cover-up for greed. They go through all of these bells and smells and all of these religious ceremonies, but what they're doing is basically covering up the life of greed and materialism. And so he says, don't or guard against that yeast. Yeast is something, as you know, you put it in bread and it spreads. Guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You all know what hypocrisy is. It means to pretend and to wear a mask, literally. It comes from the world of first century plays, where actors did not wear costumes, they wore masks, either the heroine or the villain in the story. And so the word hypocrite means to speak from underneath a mask. So you're pretending to be somebody you're not. Don't be like religious people who pretend to be Christians. They show up on Sunday morning, they go through their religious rituals, but if you look at their lifestyle at home and at work, they don't act like Christians at all. They're pretenders. Don't be pretenders. Nothing is hidden. Here's the motivation why we shouldn't do that. Nothing is hidden that will not be revealed. Nothing is secret that will not be made known. So that whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you've whispered in the ears, in private conversations, will be proclaimed on the housetop. So he's giving us a motivation as to why we should not be pretend Christians. Now, let me frame this. The crowds have, are trampling. They're, they're huge. But we're told that the Pharisees have just gone out and made plans to get rid of Jesus. They hated him because he told them that, well, called them some names. He called them fools. <laughs> he accused them of hypocrisy. So the religious leadership is going to go out and try to capture Jesus. But the crowds right now are following him by the thousands. 
when religion gets popular, but there's leadership that's watching, it's easy to want to hide what we believe. To hide what we believe about Jesus for fear that someone's going to get mad at us, demote us, fire us, and not be our friends anymore. And Jesus has told us in the previous context that this group called the Pharisees and the scribes are evil. He called his generation evil. Now that is the hook that I want to take you with for a minute. I want to go back in Old Testament history. This is the, this is the connect the dots procedure I want to go through in order to understand this. When Jesus called his generation evil, he was talking about the condition of their hearts. They're religious on the outside, but it's a cover-up for materialism, the lack of justice, the lack of love of God, and materialism. It's a cover-up for greed. That, what's, that is what makes people bad or evil. Now, where have we seen that before? Where have we seen the word evil in the very beginning? God gave the first family a choice between what? Good and what? Evil. And Adam failed to discern between what was good for him, good for his wife, and not good for his wife, which is what the word evil means in the Old Testament. Evil is what is anti-human. Evil is whatever is bad for people. Good is what's good for them. Adam failed in that decision. But the Bible doesn't end that theme there. Follow with me for a minute. I'm going to go on a journey, so just follow with me. The hope in the Bible that keeps being put before us is that there are people who know the difference between good and evil. Yes, there are people who know the difference between good and evil, and they're put in front of us to be our examples. One of them is Joseph. The word good and evil is all through his story. Let me show you and connect the dots. First, somebody had some dreams. Got in Pharaoh. Pharaoh had some dreams. You remember what Pharaoh's dreams were about? Seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. Do you know what the Old Testament text calls those years? Good and evil. Remember that? Well, your English Bible, in fact, sometimes masks that and puts other words in there. It talks about cows, seven cows. Literally, it's seven evil cows and seven good cows, each representing a period of time when there would be famine, which is not good for people, and seven years of plenty, which is what? Good for people. Who discerned the dreams? Who was the one who told Pharaoh what the dreams meant? It's who? Joseph. Joseph is the second Adam who shows us that there are people who can discern between what? Good and evil. He is a better Adam. He is a new Adam. He is the kind of man that is always good for leadership. Someone who knows the difference between what's good for people and what's evil for people. Well, later on, his brothers come years later looking for food because the land of Canaan is under the famine. And what does Joseph do? What does Joseph do to illustrate how he knows between evil and good? He puts the brothers who sold him into slavery, they were evil. What they did was evil. And he puts them through a series of tests. And what's the purpose of the tests? To see if they've changed from being evil to what? Good. And the series of tests he puts them through, without them knowing who he was, was how did they treat Benjamin, the boy at home, and how did they treat their father. And through these tests, what did Joseph discern? That whereas those brothers used to be evil, they sold him into slavery, then lied to dad about it, 
What did this series of tests show about Joseph, or about his brothers, that they were now, well, becoming mature and better men? And the test, or the proof of that was what? They showed remorse and grievance and sorrow for the meanness and the mistreatment of their brother Joseph. Joseph was the one, see, who discerned between evil people and people who were on the way to becoming what? Good. Joseph prefigures Jesus, who called his generation what? Evil. Why? Because they were all involved in some sort of a prostitution ring? No. His generation was evil because it had to do with what? With money. With greed. With the lack of pursuing justice in Israel. Concern for the poor. And very little concern for the love of God. It was all about the show that they put on Sunday morning. It was all about making people feel comfortable. Jesus says that's evil because you've overlooked the most important thing. So if I go back to Joseph, Joseph prefigures people who know the difference between evil and good. Um, this thing that I'm unraveling here goes back to one of the themes that unites the whole Bible together. And it's who is the family that belongs to the seed of the serpent and who belongs to the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. And both the brothers start out looking like seed of the serpent. But they end up looking like they come from the seed of the woman. There's a change in their lifestyles. Uh, Saul of Tarsus started out someone who persecuted Jesus. He is viewed as the seed of the serpent. But he meets Christ and what happens? The scales, the snake scales fall from his eyes, Acts 9, and he becomes the seed of the woman. And he becomes a protagonist rather than an antagonist. So in this story, the Pharisees are viewed as who? The seed of the serpent. And it's Jesus and his followers who become what? Seed of the woman. The seed of the promise. So with that framework, when we look at this story, Jesus is acknowledging that the religious leadership of his day are evil. They're evil people only because of their attitudes towards people and their attitude towards money. You can find out a lot about a person by how they spend their money and how attached they are to money. Paul looks back at this and calls it idolatry, greed. The love of things, the love of money, that's what makes people, in addition to other things, evil, jealousy, envy, those are the things that create evil. And Jesus says it's during those times that we are tempted to be quiet and not explain or say what we believe. So Jesus is encouraging us not to hide. With leadership like that, don't hide what you believe about me. Go on record, be courageous, because one day, everything you've tried to hide is going to be shouted from the rooftops. You know, at the judgment day, everything that we have said and everything we have done is going to be replayed for the whole universe. Everyone will see and hear what we have done. So it's no good to hide. Go ahead and speak up for Jesus during difficult days. During days even when leadership is hypocritical. The second paragraph gives us a motivation. How do we speak up? How can we overcome the fear of people? And the fear of people is a natural thing. It's a very normal thing not to want people to know what we believe. So what it does, he gives encouragement in verse 4. He says, verse 4, I tell you, my friends. You see that? Now when you learn to observe the Bible, 
you learn to observe things you've never seen before. And the word my friends, you've never seen before in all of the Gospel of Luke. So it's not just sort of this little fill-in word that he put into the text. Hey, buddies! No. The word friend comes from the phrase in the first century being a friend of Caesar. If you were in that group called the friends of Caesar, that meant that if somebody messed with you, that Caesar came to your aid. That you were under Caesar's protection. So Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, he's saying, if you're one of my friends, I will come to your aid and I will come to your protection. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, which is a normal thing to do. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but afterwards they've got nothing more they can do. I warn you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after killing you, has the authority to throw you into hell. <laughs> now, Jesus knows the Father. Jesus spent eternity with the Father. He knows the Father. And He knows our inclination to be scared, to speak up in front of people. But He says, you know what? People have a limit in terms of their authority. Once they kill you, they're done. The person you really ought to be fearful about is what? Is the one who, after you're dead, determines your destiny. You ought to fear that guy. God himself. But he's not done. He's not done providing us with incentive and motivation to speak up and not to be scared. He says, aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yes. Uh, you probably have never gone to Publix and bought sparrows. But in the marketplace, sparrows were a form of food. And it was the cheapest food that even the poor people could find. Two pennies, and you get five sparrows. That's a bargain. It's not a whole lot of a meal for shredded tweed, but it, it's better than nothing. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yeah, yet none of them is forgotten by God. Really? <laughs> really? How many birds are, are there in the world, would you say? Not bird species. How many birds are in the world? And yet it says here, not one of them is forgotten by God. Not one sparrow. Really? So the tiniest thing, the cheapest thing, the most insignificant thing in the market, is not forgotten by God. He's not through. In fact, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Every day, you lose hair. Every day, I lose hair. It's a sad thing. It's nothing we can stop. When you look at the shower drain, you know things are happening that shouldn't happen. I don't keep track of how many hairs I lose per day to you. I mean, do you have any chart on the refrigerator? Lost two more hairs today. Or lost 20,000. And yet each day, God is aware of and keeps track of the number of hairs on our head. Huh? Yes. The most insignificant part of us, our hair, is something that God is very, very aware of. So what's Luke doing? What's Jesus doing? He's telling us that the reason we don't have to fear and the reason we don't have to be scared in front of people is that we are com comprehensively known to our Father even in the most detailed, tiny, little ways. And there's no person, no child in this room, no baby in this room that God is not totally aware of, completely, from head to toe, every moment of the day. With that kind of care and confidence and comfort, we can be courageous about what we believe about Jesus. We are under his care. Never for a moment does he lose track of us. We've lost kids in the past. If you have a bunch of kids, sometimes it's hard to keep track of them all. Even if they all have red hair, sometimes it's hard to keep track of them. The Father has no problem at all in keeping track of who we are, where we are, even the most insignificant little details of our lives. So Jesus is encouraging us
based on the love of the Father, which we sang about this morning, is that that ought to give us comfort and confidence in not being afraid to speak up about what we believe, even though that's a normal and a natural tendency. A couple of things come to my mind as I think about this. Some here are more vulnerable to fear of people. Some of you are more vulnerable and more at risk in keeping your faith quiet. Some of you are not fearful at all. So I'm not going to talk to you this morning, but I'd like to help you if you are aware of your anxiety before people. If you're aware of it, to tap you on the shoulder for a minute. People who are very conscious about what people say about them are those who are devastated by criticism. You can't handle it. You're very conscious of what people think of you. Those are some symptoms that perhaps this message ought to be something you revert to take and chew on the cut. It is you who run the risk of being silent when you ought to speak up. It is you. It is you, you who are at risk, who have much to gain, much encouragement to gain from what Jesus has to say. And Jesus ought to know. He spent time with his father. He knows that he himself is under the care and providential guidance of his father. So if this is something that you struggle with, take some time and address God, your father, about this issue, about your fear. And ask him to give you courage to speak up in the school cafeteria, if that's where you're at, or at work, or in conversation with your neighbors. Don't be afraid of what you believe. Don't be afraid of what you believe. There is a time to be fearful. Like, for example, when I was in that field, fear is a protective mechanism. Fear is a gift in some ways. You fear going to the edge of the cliff. That's a good fear. You fear crossing the street because the cars are going by. That's a good fear. But fear of what people will do to you because of what you believe is very unhealthy and toxic. And I'm asking you to consider this if you're vulnerable and if you find yourself at risk. Don't hear condemnation. No. Hear instead encouragement and comfort and a desire to see you move ahead. There's two things that Luke is presenting to us here this morning. Primarily, is that if we fear speaking up and hiding what we believe, that fearing God is the cure for that. Fearing God, the one who has the most authority over us at the end of day and at the end of life. So what do you think I did? What do you think I did staring down the barrel of a high-powered rifle? I couldn't hide. If there's one thing I could do. I ran. I ran in the opposite direction as fast as my little old legs could take me. And thank you, Lord, I did not hear the gunshot. But it's always made me cautious when I see a gun and a rifle. Because I remember that day as if it were yesterday. It was, there was a time to fear, but there's a time to speak up. And I hope this week God gives you that opportunity to speak up. Remember, your Father cares for you. And one day, all of us will see the times when we've been bold. I think our children need to see us courageous and bold in an appropriate, winsome, balanced way. I hope that will be your legacy that you pass on to your kids and they can pass on to their children. Thanks for listening this morning. Let's stand. Let's pray. Forgive us, Lord, for being cowards when we ought to be courageous. Being ashamed of you, you who were not ashamed to die for us on a cross. You who were not ashamed to die buck naked and bear our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for being courageous in so many other ways. 
being fearful about it, speaking up about what we believe. Instill a new, fresh confidence, comfort, and courage so that we, Lord, as a people, will be known by our fearlessness about what we believe. It'll make a difference in people who listen. It'll make a difference in our children. It'll make a difference in people who hear us at work and at school. They'll see someone who had courage. And maybe it'll lock up courage in their hearts as well. Thank you for being with us and for your patience with us and for being our great God. Thank you in Christ's name. My sight and my hair as well. The blessing today is taken from 1 Thess 5, 23 and 24. There's a place for me and a place for you called all. So I ask you to lift up your voice as we prepare to depart. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify us completely. So, by be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls us will do it, who also will do it. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you.